This is a wood gasifier that I built a couple of years ago. It's actually an improvement on a first design, so this is the version 2 where I think I have most of the bugs worked out. I was thinking that there might be some interest in seeing how I built it and how they work. And if you're not familiar with the gasifier, this is in fact your first time hearing the word, then don't worry, I'll go into that. Gasification is essentially controlled pyrolysis, and what pyrolysis means is the expedited decomposition of a material through heating. So the way that this works in our case is we have a material, for example, wood chips, but you can use any sort of organic carbonaceous biomass. I'm just using wood pellets because they're convenient, they're already bone dry, and I don't have to do any work in preparing them, but you can also use any any sort of dry organic material. So wood is obviously a go-to option because it's readily available and also energy dense, but you can also use paper, you can use coal, you can use dried leaves, you can use dried horse manure. Really any dry organic flammable mass will work just fine for producing our syngas. So what is syngas? Syngas is, is the product of what's left over after we pyrolyze our medium down here. And on average, it's composed of about 20% hydrogen, 20% carbon monoxide, and between 50 to 60% nitrogen, which is a little bit of methane in there by weight. And of course, all that we're left over with down here is almost pure carbon. When you burn a pile of wood on the ground, for example, you're only using up about one third of the potential energy of that firewood and the remaining two-thirds goes up in the air in the form of flammable gases that haven't flashed off yet. And so essentially the principle for this is allowing that to happen in an oxygen-deprived environment and then taking those leftover gases, filtering them, cooling them, getting all the contaminants out and most of the water, and then we can use that gas left over to power an internal combustion engine or just to burn for lighting, cooking, or a number of other things. So this piece is really where all the magic happens. This is called the burn bowl or shaker grate, depending on who you're talking to. And in my case, it's just a stainless steel bowl with holes drilled through the bottom for ventilation. So these wood pellets under here, not just the surface pellets, are reacting. So we're getting more gas and a more efficient process. So all this is, is something to hold our material for it to burn in where it can also be exposed to air. This is called the fire tube. And the diameter of this and the length of this is important in calculating how much gas we'll be able to produce and thus how big of an engine you'll be able to run. In my case with this being, I think it's around a four and three quarter inch fire tube, I'll be able to run about a 20 to 25 horsepower engine, which should more than power most generators out there for home use. So after we're through with the flame tube, all we have left to do is store fuel that can be fed by gravity into the shaker grid eventually. And so I've got this half a Freon can that you can see with some sheet metal just to seal it all up, and then reduces it down to this size. And then I needed more storage, so I simply welded this five gallon propane tank on top, added a simple lid. Of course, it's important with a lid since you'll be drawing air through the system via this fan, which I'll get to later. You have to have a place for air to enter, so make sure you don't seal it up completely. Obviously, this isn't a complete setup because if I were to burn anything in this, the gases would simply escape out into the environment and I would get absolutely no use out of them. So as an ash catch and a containment vessel, I'm using this other Freon can that I just had the top cut off of. That, as you can see, has these latches, which form up on these here and a gasket running along the inside of this to seal up against this surface so we have an airtight system, which is also another thing that I need to mention because it's very important to have a completely airtight system in a gasifier because what can happen is that can lead to a dangerous stoichiometry or the mixture of fuel to air that could result in an explosion. So be very, very careful if you were to replicate this and I would encourage you to do lots and lots of research before attempting to. So we've got the fire tube, We've got the burn grate, and we also have an ignition port. This is where you'll start the gasification process by igniting the carbon from a previous burn. The first startup of a gas fire is always the most difficult because you have to ignite the material. You don't have the assistance from the leftover carbon. So, so after the first burn, you're left with this nice combustible base that you can simply ignite. Now there's one other component that you should have on a stationary gas fire. And I say stationary because aside from running home generators, you can also make them large enough to power a full-size vehicle. And in a moving vehicle, you don't need this shaker grate to move because the motion of the vehicle is enough to sift down the already spent ash and such. The carbon that's no longer useful and inhibiting airflow will be agitated by the motion of the vehicle and just fall out into your catchment case, in my case this. So in a stationary gas fire, you have to have a way to agitate this every so often. You'll notice it's suspended by chains, one link welded up here, and then just bolted here. As you probably noticed, this does not have a way to externally agitate this. And I found that it isn't entirely necessary. I can run this for a very long time, and it seems to do a well enough job of cleaning itself out without my input. So as far as actual construction goes, it's mostly made of Freon cans. So I've got this one here, as I said, this piece of sheet metal, reducing it down to this size, and then this taper. So this tube goes all the way down to here and does not stop. This is just a collar over it, made of the removed top of a Freon can with a hole 
the same size as the external diameter of this tube, and another can lid turned over and welded to make sort of a patty shape right underneath of here. And then I took a piece of flat bar, and you can see the difference in the seam. You can see the seam between the two halves of the Freon can and the seam between the flat bar that I welded on. And the purpose for this flat bar is to offer a surface to support the sides of this container. And because I have the nice taper of the inside of that Freon can, it guides it right into this channel between the two, which I have inserted a piece of, which I've inserted a piece of fiberglass wood stove gasket into to give it a nice airtight seal. Okay, now you can see I've got that cover back on. I've got the grate closed. And the only purpose for this is just to keep hands away from the burn tube because it does get fairly warm and I don't want anything flammable coming into contact with it. And of course, I don't want somebody to touch it with their bare hand. And it's just being held closed with this spring that I bent into a nice shape that made it somewhat ergonomic. As you can see, these draw latches hold this in place and also press it firmly against the gasket lining the inside. And I've never once noticed a leak around this seam. So I think that covers most of this part, which is technically called the reactor, which is really where all the important stuff happens. But we can't use the gas produced by this yet because it's too dirty, too full of water vapor, and it'll reduce the life of our engine. So what we're doing is we're filtering it with these two filters out here. So here's our outlet from the reactor. It's just one and a quarter inch steel pipe. And you'll want the place where the gas draws relatively high in your reaction chamber because you want the contaminants, which are generally heavier, to stay down. And the lighter elements, like the hydrogen, will flow up and into here. And of course, we'll still be drawing up a lot of ash, a lot of carbon, a lot of other things, but we'll filter those out a little bit later, starting with this which is a simple cyclone filter made out of another Freon can. So I have this going in at an angle. So what happens is the gas goes there and then it spins along the side walls all the way down until it gets drawn out by this, the draw tube, which sits just a couple of inches from the bottom. And the cool side walls of the cyclone filter condense out a lot of the water and tar that you would find in your fuel, especially if you're using something like wood that's not completely dry. And there will be quite a bit of tar produced as well, and this will help filter some of that out. And as the sides get wet and from the water and sticky from the tar, they also trap a lot of the particulate material simply just by adhesion. And of course, as those liquids and the tars build up, gravity will pull them down, and then they'll follow this taper into our collection jar. And you can see, I, well, that's stuck. And you can see I have this rain this quite a bit. There's just a little bit of that nastiness down there in the bottom. But because I'm using wood pellets that are just pressed together, there's really not a lot of garbage in there that needs to be filtered out. So very little production. Either that or my filter doesn't work. Okay, next up after that, gets drawn up from down below in the cyclone filter, goes up, goes into here, which is where hopefully a lot more of the cooling is gonna take place because we really wanna get all of the water that we can out of our gas before it gets to our engine. So this is just a simple radiator made out of two inch rectangular tubing and then one inch pipe. So obviously the operating principles are quite simple. Gas just goes up, cools on the way up, and of course a lot of those heavier gases, we want mostly hydrogen in this. And hydrogen, of course, is the lightest element. So having this be as tall as possible can actually be beneficial to our gas production process. And that's really all there is to it. Next, we move on to the blower, which is a very vital part of our setup because when you get a gas fire running, the vacuum of the engine pulling, you know, on the intake stroke of the piston, where it goes down and draws in fuel, a vacuum is created and then it pulls air through our gas fire system. So there is no external power needed for this to function once the engine is running. But in order to get it to that state, we have to have a way to pull the gas through. And of course, it's quite a complicated system with lots of turns, lots of restrictions. So we're gonna need quite a powerful air pump to do so. So this one, I just made myself out of some HVAC duct. So it's quite thin, but it's more than good enough. It's just pop riveted together. Obviously I came up with a pattern, put it on paper, traced onto the metal, cut it out with a nibbler cutter, leaving tabs, bent them over, and then pop riveted it together. And of course, that's not gonna be quite airtight. So I added some wood stove sealing tape and I think it turned out quite nice. As far as the blower itself, this is salvaged from a 1992 Dodge Dakota. This was just a temperature control blower that pushed air around your cab to keep it cool or warm. Now the nice part about this is it's a 12 volt fan, so you can run it off of a battery. So in the event of a power outage, you're not gonna have 120 volts to start this thing up. That would be kind of counterintuitive. So make sure if you replicate this, think about these things and go with the 12 volt motor. And of course, it's just drawing through the system, pushing out this tube, which I have going to this piece of one inch pipe here. That's just being held in place with this hose clamp. And of course, the reason for this is I can light this on fire and the metal won't burn like the tubing will. This is just a clear braided hose that I picked up at my local hardware store. And I was worried about how corrosive the gases were that were being produced by this and whether or not this would hold up. But in the couple of years that I've had it, I've run it quite a few times and I've had no issues. It doesn't feel brittle, still soft. It is quite cold out, so it's not 
as soft as it could be, but once it warms up, you'll see. This is just a barb the size of the hose that I threaded into the sheet metal here. And now we're gonna start it up. I'll walk you through that process and we're gonna see if we can run that generator. So this cage is on a hinge on that side so you can see I can just remove the spring, swing it right open, and have access to my ignition port there. Okay, so there's sort of a universal starting sequence to most gas fires out there. It's a pretty complicated high-tech process, but I think you can bear with me. Newspaper. Good old newspaper. So we're just gonna roll it up, hook it down in our ignition tube, and that is all set. Remember, I've got leftover carbon from previous burns, so this should take right off as soon as I get the motor going and ignite the end of this. Okay, our newspaper is in place. Next step is to turn that fan on so it can start pulling air through. With any luck, since this has less resistance than pulling air through all of this material, you should draw air in through here and pull that flame down into our carbon. Okay, our battery is connected. We have our fan. You can hear it's running currently. Get this ball rolling. You see my flame being drawn in by the suction of the blower. There we go. You can see we've already got smoke being produced at the end over there. And we're going. That's what things look like down inside of our shaker grate right now. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and cap this back off. And we're gonna close our safety grate here, fasten it with our spring, and we're all set to go. It's been about three minutes. We're getting close, but we're not quite there yet. I can do a quick demonstration to show you guys just how well this filter setup works. Down here, you can see that's quite hot. The water is beating up, falling off, evaporating, steaming, you can see it. Up here, same deal quite hot. We we'll go up to the top of this, however. No reaction. As a matter of fact, I can touch this with my bare hand with no issue. It's amazing what can happen in that short distance there. One more very important thing that I forgot to mention. And it just occurred to me as I was sitting here waiting for this to start producing gas for about 20 minutes. Make sure your fuel is completely, completely dry. And I thought I was in the clear, but there was some old fuel in the fire tube leftover from the last time I used this that was soaked. You can see it just turns into this complete mush. So I cleaned it out, restarted it, nothing's changed. We're starting to produce gas now. And while we're here, why don't we just give it a shot? Hey, see that? That is fire, fire good. So as this heats up a little bit more, eventually we'll have a sustaining flame here that won't need the assistance of it blowtorch or a lighter. See that. Okay, so obviously the gas coming out is still quite thick. And that's because to get every bit of contaminant out of this, we're gonna need a lot more of a complicated system than what I have. But as you can see, all it needs is this to be clean enough to burn. Moment of truth. And we've got sustaining flame. You can see the volume this produces is quite substantial. And one thing I forgot to mention is that the tube running from your blower down to your engine or whatever you have running off of this is also going to act like a condenser. So you will have some liquid buildup in there. So be mindful of that. If you were using this for home installation, you actually had a unit that was installed there and already hooked up to a generator. That's just one thing that you need to be aware of. The longer of a run you have from your gasifier to your generator, the better off you'll be and the more fluid that you'll be able to condense out of your gas. Okay, we've got flammable gas. Now it's the moment you've all been waiting for. We're gonna to try to start this generator here. And the way I'm going to do that is simply by blowing the gas into the intake of the carburetor. Move that until this a second so I can actually see. Ordinarily, you'd have this piped straight into the carburetor with a T and another valve coming off to the side. So you would adjust the gas and the airflow from the outside to get a perfect stoichiometry to get your engine to run the best it can off this gas. So it's, so it's sort of like a, like a primary carburetor, if you will, but for now, we're just going to do that, and that should work.
are officially using wood throughout this contraption, the gasifier, out of that hose and onto the generator. I don't have the fuel line hooked up, just so you know it's 100% running off of skin gas. And that's it! Okay, I think that's just about it. In this video, I covered how I built it, how gasification works and the end product. You can see how much flame is being produced here. Substantial amount for the small amount of wood that will be consumed to generate that. So I hope you found this video interesting at the very least, or maybe I piqued your curiosity, and you'll either build one for yourself or do a little more research into the technology, because this stuff has been around for hundreds of years. In the 1800s, gasification was used mostly with coal as a fuel source to produce town gas for cooking and lighting. So this has been around for a very long time. I don't know why more people don't know about it. I think this is an awesome technology and I'm trying to bring it to the attention of more people because I think it can be utilized specifically from a preparedness standpoint because as you can see, I'm surrounded by fuel. <laughs> so no matter what, I will always have something to generate electricity while having this around and that's a really comforting thought. If you could show your support by liking and subscribing, that would be awesome. I'm trying to give this whole YouTube thing a try and I'm hopefully going to be putting out videos once a week of weird little stuff like this. And please let me know if you enjoyed this video. I like hearing feedback from you guys and if you have any more questions on this then please just ask and I'll be more than happy to try to answer them for you. So anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you didn't enjoy it then at least I hope it was entertaining. <laughs> Thanks, see you later.